I said before I was going to come back and talk solutions. Can I just say these solutions aren't mine? I started it off some time ago, um, well, last year, um, and a lot of members out of the 33,400 people who would have been nice if they were here today have, have contributed to. So these are not, this is what I would call a people document. Every Liberal politician has a copy of this. Every ALP politician has a copy of it. Rachel, I know, has got a copy of it. Let's go few, through a few things. It's broken down. The Canadian judicial system. They have jobs for life. So they can basically do what they want. They are not accountable. We know they're not accountable to anyone, not even to the government. That's wrong. Stop. Governments can't sack judges or magistrates. It needs to change. That is wrong. So here's something we can do. If we cannot sack them from their job for life, then why don't we put them all on contracts? Yes. And those contracts yes. get renewed every 12 months after they have been through some form of peer group, maybe, I don't know, independent body assessment what they've done. And if they have not been up to par with our laws and what the people want, then their contracts do not get renewed. That's not sacking them. That's just not giving them their job back. We all know the Victorian judicial system is... Happy, hey. sort it out. Hi. We all know. <laughs> the mics don't like you, hey. <laughs> okay. The Victorian judicial system is broken everywhere. The whole thing needs to be overhauled, you burnt to the ground, and from its ashes a new one built up. They're, they're, that's quite clear that that's where one of our biggest problems are. The age limit for sentencing offenders to adult prison found guilty of committing violent home invasions, carjackings, business invasions and assaults must be lowered to the age of 16. Yes. If you're going to carry a machete around the streets and cart people up, you can go to jail. Yes. Lock them up. Offenders found guilty of committing these horrendous crimes where they have actually used weapons should have an extra five to ten years added on to their sentence. Yay! The practice of magistrates and judges sentencing offenders who are 18 to 23 to youth detention centres must cease. Yes, go to jail! In Australia the law is quite clear. At the age of 18, you are an adult. Yes. If you're going to do a big boy's crime, then you need to go to a big boy's jail. Yes. Yes. Violent criminals who are convicted in the courts of a violent crime, who are not Australian citizens, should be deported. Yes. Right? They must be deported. And it doesn't matter what country they come from. For example, somebody will tell me what his name was. He played in the Richmond Grand Final. His father is tied up with a bikey gang in New Zealand. Sorry? Dustin Martin. Oh, Dustin Martin. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, Dustin Martin. His father was kicked out of Australia. His father's a Kiwi, a white, Caucasian New Zealander. So it's not that our laws are biased to these people. It's the same law fits all. Well, from a federal government point of view it is. It's not from a Victorian government point of view, right? Yes. And that's not racist. If you're not from our country, if you've been invited in to live here, whilst you're waiting for Australian citizenship, and you broke the law, then we'd rather have you replaced with somebody here who's going to be a nice citizen. Well, the criminals have to be sentenced based on the crime that they have committed. Not on their race, not on their upbringing, not on their religion, but on the crime. Yes, yes, yes. In the case of violent crime, judges and magistrates should not hand down the sentence. The victims of crime should. The chances of getting that up are extremely slim. When an offender 
is presented to the court all previous documentation on his offences or her offences is to be made available to the judge or the magistrate. Currently that does not happen for youth offences. But a guy can commit five home invasions and um, be charged for his fifth one and uh, courts don't get to see all of the information on. Right, that was the judicial system. Magistrates and judges serving in the Victoria, serving in our state, must be voted on to the bench by both houses of parliament. That's the government and the opposition. Currently they are put onto the bench by the government. The government, as we know, as we know is headed up by Daniel Andrews, who comes from the socialist left of the ALP. Quite clearly, quite clearly, the people he is going to have appointed to the bench are going to be civil libertarians. These people exist in a world where they think when people commit crimes that are pure evil, these people should be given the chance to rehabilitate. There are some crimes that are so god awful ugly, there should be no rehabilitation for. You go to jail. I mentioned juries must be given the power to sentence. Okay, juries become defined. Okay, offenders. <laughs> Oh God. I mentioned before I spoke to uh, some youth offenders, um, current staff at the youth detention centres, um, uh, ex-staff at the youth detention centres. Um, I can tell you now, the private security companies they got in, they that's right. Um, I'm married with two kids, I mean I know what life's like, I know what hate's all about, you know. We have a teenage daughter, trust me, I know what hate's all about. <laughs> she serves after me all the time. All right. Don't listen to what some people will tell you about our youth detention centres. We've all heard the stories or seen them in the paper and on the media about our youth offenders in youth detention centres having the ability to get pizza on a Friday night. They also get the offer of McDonald's and the KFC on Friday and Saturday nights. If they get out of bed in the mornings when they are meant to, and make their beds, they get paid money. That's our money, taxpayers' money. They get paid for doing that. Apparently it's meant to be to treat them nicely. Oh, by the way, they have a very high attrition rate amongst the staff at these centres. People go there for a while and they've just had enough. Um, the other thing that happens is that uh, the kids actually get paid if they sweep their room. They will get paid um, they have about three to four hours school that's run by, I think it's a TAFE college. But if they actually attend the schooling, they get paid more money. It's called canteen spend. It's our now, money. That is our money. Um, the other thing to note from this is that um, when they go in for their school lessons, and this has come from some of the inmates of both, I'll be in for, when they go in for these lessons, they will grab themselves an iPad, iPhone, laptop, whatever and put in the earplugs. They're not interested in being taught anything. They're just surfing the internet. They have, a, they have computers where they can surf the internet. They have games rooms. They have television. It is not a deterrent. There was a young lady recently sentenced in court to Parkville. She didn't hear what the judge said. The judge said, you're going to Parkville. She said, oh, thank you, Your Honor. I like that place. That is not a deterrent. You should fear these places. And that might stop some crime. Yes. There should be no bail for any offender regardless of age if the police oppose bail. Because I'll tell you now, the police prosecution are opposing bail all the time. It's the judges, the court systems that's letting us down, not the police. Any youth offender or adult prisoner who breaks prison rules, who is disrespectful for staff, because in our youth detention centres, there's a tremendous amount of swearing, speaking at the staff, abusing them, and there's nothing the staff can do. So I've got this really, really good idea. We should abolish our youth detention centres and let us make them boot camps. Let us say to the young, if you are going to screw up, or you are going to be sent to a youth detention centre, then this is now going to be a boot camp. Let me take you back to my young army days. 
my really young army days. King recruit training. Every morning, six o'clock. We were made to get out of bed, stand in the hallways with the sheets around us. There was a roll call. We then had five minutes to make our beds. They had to be made in a special way. If the staff on duty, the um, NCOs on duty, could not bounce a 20 cent piece off your blanket, they ripped the bed up. What they basically did was they broke down our civilian life and then slowly but surely turned us into military people. In Texas, they do that now, they have boot camp for youth offenders. They have a 3% re-offending rate. They've just done a big doco on it on uh, SBS, if you want to go to uh, SBS On Demand or something, look up this one. Um, they have a 3% offending rate. What the judge in Texas actually says to them, you want to go to jail or do you want to go to a youth detention centre? Because they sentence kids to, or people who are 16, that age 16 to jail, right? If the kid says I want to go to the, the boot camp, he'll be sent there for X amount of months, depending on the severity of his crime. If at any stage he decides to leave that boot camp program, he goes to jail. Big boys jail. In the mornings, they're out of bed, there's a roll call. They hammer them constantly, right? On the drill square. They march everywhere they go. They are in uniform. They have to address the staff as Mr. or Sir or Miss, Mrs. or Ma'am. There are no first name jobs. You don't apply or abide by those rules, you will go first offence, solitary confinement. You break those rules again, you're out of the program and you go to jail. To me, if we made our boot camps like that, our youth detention centres like that, and what they do is they actually break down the criminal element of the kids, and then they start to build them back up again. In the later stages, if the boys or the girls are going really well, they start rewarding them, letting them have school lessons, having people come in to talk to them about different things they can do in their lives. They reward them. It's like training monkeys, I guess, you know, dogs, based on a reward system. Because some of these kids are so mixed up in their head that they need hard, harsh lessons of life. I love, I love boot camp, I love it. Won't happen under this government, though. Oh, the other thing that they have in boot camps, they have lots of Xboxes, um, um, uh, uh, game stuff. Um, if you want one of the fellow years bashed, depending on the severity of the bashing you want him to have, it will cost you anything from $10 to $30. But that's paid for by camping spend that the kids are getting. It's their way of dominating in the jail system, but I'll use the detention centre. Okay, police. Chief Commissioner for Victoria and his Deputy Commissioners of Victoria are appointed, uh, should be appointed from within the Victorian Police Force. No more outsiders that do not understand policing in our state. No more outsiders. Let's make them Victorian coppers. Who worked up you know, come up through the ranks, it must be a huge insult to our police to have, you know, people who've spent donkey's years in the police force and then all of a sudden they get some bosses from the feds or from New South Wales. The police must resume proactive policing. I have any one of a number of messages from police officers who are members of our site who say that they actually have to sit in the stations and wait for the jobs to roll in. To prevent a home invasion or a carjacking, it is better if you have people in police cars actually out there driving around doing their job. Yeah. And that's what they want to do. Okay, police officers should be allowed to make decisions. These guys do a minimum of 33 weeks basic training at the police academy. Um, I don't know how many specialist courses and all that sort of stuff they do. But they have a charge, right? Their charge is to protect life and protect property. <coughs> They should not have to go back through police command to have the police command make a decision for them. They should make that decision based on the information they see in front of their eyes. And virtually the prime example.
know if you guys do much research on Snapchat or um, Facebook or you're like, I'm an old fogey, I have to recruit my kids to help me here. But there are numerous photographs on Facebook of youth offenders laying on beds with the stuff they have stolen from a home invasion. We're talking jewellery, we're talking car keys, we're seeing photographs of blokes standing in front of BMWs. The police department really do need to set up a group who will monitor this. Because fundamentally, the people who are doing these crimes are quite stupid. If I did those crimes, there's no way in the world I would put myself up on a Facebook group. But, so if they monitor them, and then go and grab those people, then we'll be all the better for it. I happened to um, come some time ago to the Youth Justice Centre inquiry, which was held here. Um, I wasn't allowed to speak, unfortunately, but anyway. Um, I was stunned when I heard all these people going in there inquiring and saying how they needed more funding to help with their rehabilitation programs. I was even more stunned when I found out later from a politician, and let's target a particular group, the Jesuit services, 70% of the money that they get from the government, our money, goes on salaries. It does not go on rehabilitation programs. Only 30% does. And I would argue that every organisation that offers rehabilitation in this state is probably on the same. The jobs for boys. That needs to be overhauled. Actually, it needs to be stopped. Stuff them. They don't deserve rehabilitation. citizens are to be exempt from prosecution when defending themselves, other people and their property from crime criminals wanting to do that. Yes. If you happen to kill an invader when he is invading your home, then you have every goddamn right to do that. Yes. Yes. Self-protection items in the state of Victoria such as pepper spray, pepper spray should be legalised. Yep. Yeah. officers the other day and um, I was talking about this and a few other things. They said to me, mate, we know where these gangs are. We go out to the parks, we see them, we get out of the cars to try and liaise them. They swear at us, they throw things at us, they spit on us, and we can't arrest them for that. What? Why? We're not allowed to. Jesus, I remember when I was a young kid, I was about 14, a mate and I, we had a couple of shanghais in those days. Um, and we were in a park shooting at birds, lucky birds, who were bad shots. The police caught us. They took our pants down and took off their belts and gave us a slap around the ass. Then they took us home to our parents, and I can tell you now, my father went apeshit, right? I mean, he went apeshit. He gave me another one. We need more of that discipline. Yeah. Martin Pakula. Martin Pakula, the Attorney General, loves this one. Bargaining. What this basically means, if you throw a punch, a coward punch, and you kill the person, you can plea bargain that down to accidental. And therefore only get charged for manslaughter. Which is a lesser charge, three to five years, I think. Right? That is one of a number of crimes, for argument's sake. Now, I don't know why the police prosecution won't, won't address this. I really do if they would. Um, but... There are cases of women who are being stalked and the police can't do anything about it despite some of these women having 10 year intervention orders already against the guy doing it. So he goes back and does it again and they can plea bargain down this stuff. He can do a home invasion, a carjacking or whatever and because of this rule of exceptional circumstances he can say look, my client's not going to plead guilty to assault because he stabbed somebody with a knife However, he will plead guilty to break an entry. The police prosecution allow that. The reason they allow that is because it closes the books on the crime. And they haven't got to fight a court case. So I've got some simple advice to police prosecutors. Fight the goddamn court case! Yes. Right? Fight the court case! Yes. If they've assaulted somebody, then charge them with assault. So, so pool bargaining, get, get rid of it. I mean, if you're going to be charged with a crime, don't waste your time. Martin Pakula actually said some time ago um, that um, 
When it comes to plea bargaining, it's the way it is under this government, it's the way it will be and it's the way it should be. That is bullshit. It's not the way it should be, Mr Pakula. You, one thing that Mr Pakula proves is that um, eating at McDonald's restaurants makes you overweight. <laughs> Just a personal opinion. Right, former council victims, victims of violent crime must be supported by the state government until such time as they recover. In other words, if you spend, if you suffer a very violent crime, and you have to spend some time in a mental health hospital on programs, because I've spoken to Delmont Private Hospital and the one in Box Hill about the sort of programs that they have for our victims of crime. And um, some of them are a mess, right? Some of them are suicidal when they get, that's why they go in there. They, the doctors have told them, you need to go in here and get your head straightened out. They do a lot of programs with them. If they don't have private health cover, they're screwed. We should be paying that. That's where our tax money should be going to support the victims of crime. Yeah. Family counselling must be free. Give it all to the victims of crime. I was talking to somebody the other day who was dealing with the victims of crime issue and she said that um, uh, she rang up about her, her particular case, which I won't mention, still before the courts, but she rang up and she said, I honestly felt when I was speaking to this person at the Victims of Crime Tribunal that I was the offender. They treated me with absolute disrespect. So if Greg Davis, who heads up the Victims of Crime Tribunal, wishes to talk, to, wishes to talk to me, I will give him the name of that person, and you might like to sack her. If she is in a row like that, she needs to be sympathetic. <laughs> Victims must also have the right to be able to read out their victim crime statements in a court of law unedited. There are a lot of victims who have to have their victim of crime statement edited by somebody within the legal system who wasn't present when the crime occurred. That is just plain bloody dumb. Okay, anyone got the time? Okay, I'm going to spend 15 minutes doing a quick name and shame. Can I do that? Yeah. yeah. Right. Just looking around for the police. If I go to jail, I hope they send me to a youth detention centre. <laughs> I kind of like what I've heard about these places. <clears throat> well, let's start over the top. Some weeks ago, Premier Daniel Andrews spoke on TV, actually some months, two months ago. When he was going out of his way to exonerate his wife from a car accident that she had where a young person by the name of Ryan Mueller was on a bike, push bike, and got hit by that car, or he hit that car, one of the other, I don't know the full detail. I rang Andrews' office, and I can tell you now, Daniel Andrews has never ever spoken to a victim of crime for 50 minutes in his entire life. Now, I sat there listening to this, and I said to my wife, you better come and listen to this because um, um, it, it, I'm missing something here. He continually said, it was 11 a.m. in the morning when the guy hit us. The police turned up. Two police officers turned up. It's not our fault if they didn't both test us. Well, my wife, who was driving. My dear, there's no evidence to suggest that his wife was actually driving. It's only his word and her word. But let's not cast dispersions just yet. Right? But two police officers turned up and didn't breath test them. In Victoria, the law is, any, please turn up to anything. You get breath tested, particularly if it's an accident, right? So, um, when the journal from Channel 7, I think it was, or Channel 9, actually mentioned to Mr Andrews, well, maybe the police recognised you and were a bit scared, he said, oh no, the police wouldn't have recognised me. I was in my... We'd been to the beach or something. Can I just say this? The police officers that I speak to, Mr Andrews, know exactly who you are because they don't like you. I can tell you that now. They're your only friends from what appears to me in the police force is your mouthpiece, Mr Graham Ashton. I'm not even going to call him the Chief Commissioner. Did you know that Daniel Andrews and his wife, after that accident, up until today, 
have never even had the courtesy or the manners to speak to the young kid they hit. Mr Andrews, can I just say that Ryan Mueller is a very, very precious human being who you choose to ignore. What concerned me most of all about this whole interview was midway through it, I laughed the police arrived. Daniel Andrews said, look, my two young kids were screaming really bad that I had to take them home. He must have lived nearby. So he left his wife there to deal with her. I'm sort of thinking, one, if you were the driver of that vehicle, then you should not have left the scene of an accident. There has been no proof provided to anyone that he was, was not driving that car. No proof whatsoever. Shame on you, Mr. Andrews. Mr. Andrews, you even send your police to my house. Why do you do that? I'm 60. Do I look like I'm a vigilante or I'm going to go blow somebody up? I'm ex military, as you know. I've done all that blowing up shit. I didn't like it then, so I'm probably not going to like it now. But too much noise is why I have hearing aids. <laughs> and apart from that, the police always seem to know. In my house, we have two ovens, two stars, right? Um, two further mixes. My wife's a legend in the kitchen, right? But, um, that could be why I married her. But, um, actually, I enjoyed marriage so much the first time around. I did it the second time. It's brilliant. But, um, I'm sure that they smell her homemade biscuits. That's why they come around. Can I just say to those parliamentary police guys, they're for me! They're not for you! But that do, he sends his parliamentary police around to have a chat to me every now and again. And I have no idea why. Well, I mentioned about that the waste of space. Lisa Neville talking about, um, don't report some crimes to the police. Please report them. Make sure the police fill out a report because then it must go to the crime stats, which by the way is a government website, so take it or leave it. <laughs> Martin Pakula, who is the Attorney General for Victoria, also has a racing, also is a Minister for Racing. I know, interest, right? We saw the same thing with Russians in uh, the state of Queensland, <laughs> under the Sir J.B. Peterson regime, right? I would suggest to Martin Pakula that he should probably stand down from his racing portfolio, give up his resources, and concentrate not on the offenders, on the victims. Concentrate on the victims of crime. They need the government help. There goes Mr. Andrews now. He just had a heart attack. Right, I was thinking of plea, plea negotiations, plea bargaining. 90% of plea negotiations that looked at, this is a recent study done, led to two charges being withdrawn or downgraded in exchange for a plea. So that means 90% of all these people who are go to court and do a plea bargain aren't actually charged with the, with the more serious crime, but the minor one. Victims and their families under our laws do not have the right to veto a plea bargain. They've got to accept it. They're wrong. That's bullshit, isn't it? Martin Pakula's response to this when asked was, but well, that's the way it has to be. Bullshit! This is, uh, yeah. I love this lady, Harold Shing. Oh God, I love her. Huh? She's a Labor member for the Victorian Legislative, Assembly, uh, Legislative Council, which is the upper house in Victoria, representing the eastern region of Victoria. This goes to show the mindset of these people. She said, 29th of November, 2017, in the Victorian Parliament, that the Victorian people have faith in our judicial system. They're the exact words she used. Harriet Singh, you are a ding a -ling. Get out and talk to the voters, lady. Let them tell you what they think about our judicial system. Oh, more importantly, Speak to the victims of repeat offender crime. Danny yeah. O'Brien, who is the AOP member for Yan Ying, sent me an email, got a lover. This prime time idiot employed implied that Protect Victoria consisted of making inhumane rantings? Who's doing that? <laughs> for 
inhumane because we want the government and the judicial system to do something about our high levels of crime. We're not inhumane. The guys doing the offences are not inhumane. The shoes are jingling. Oh, Daniel Green and Harriet Shee. <laughs> You're sitting on low margins, Dale. We'll be coming out into your electorates. She sits on 3.7% actually, Daniel Green. That's a very marginal seat. Gabriel Williams, ALP member for Daniel, has said a lot worse. She's actually said that we are unhinged. I love that word, unhinged. We are raping nutters. She believes that the ALP government is doing enough to stop violent crime. She has said of Protect Victoria and me that all we're doing is waving our pitchforks and hurling taunts and threats. We don't hurl taunts and threats. All we're trying to do is get our security and our safety back. There's, there's, there's no threats in that. Give them back to us we go away. So once again, you've got to say, ah, yes, election year, the government is now trying to shoot the messenger of bad news. It happens every election, federal or state, right? Every election. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Did you know that on Sunday evening, 16th of April 2017, in the Windy Mile Hotel at Diamond Creek, a man by the name of Andrew Lee cowardly punched a 19-year-old Patrick Cronin. He died. He was stuck in the right temple and is dead. At the time of that offence, Lee was on bail for similar offences. A very good friend of Judge Lex Lazary sentenced Lee for killing 19-year-old Patrick to only five years in jail. This is a repeat violent offender who is an adult. Patrick Cronin and Mr. Andrews was a very, very precious human being who you ignored. On Saturday the 6th of May 2017 in the city, a gutless piece of work by the name of Richard Venkek killed the J.D. Walker in a one-punch attack. When arrested, Venkek was granted bail. On sentencing, Justice Peter Royder gave a Venkek an eight-year jail sentence, but he can be paroled after five. And he killed somebody. I'm going to be relentless from here on in with these rallies and everything and like Ballarat, Geelong, down in the marginal seats in front of the Minister's office and um, I'm just going to really keep pushing for no other reason, I mean, I'm going to tell you this, I am not running for politics, I have no intentions of running for politics. I'm not selling membership to protect Victoria, it's a free bloody site. There's nothing else in this for me. It's just to get like-minded people like me to try and force a government to take notice of us. That's all I'm doing. I mean, even if some political party offered to put me in the safest seat in Victoria, I would say no, thank you. Because before I took this job on, um, I met some military experts. I, I, I had retired. Much to my wife's disgust. But I was doing other things. More important things, you know? Who could be thinking about running for politics? I can tell you now, to the best of my knowledge, nobody who is a member of Protect Victoria is actually running for politics. Um, I don't even think Rachel's a member of Protect Victoria, some of the staff are, but um, um, nobody else that I know of is involved in it, except for a guy by the name of Mike Palmer, who's kicked off a political party. Right? Mike, Mike Palmer runs the Navy Rights Group, I'm not sure if you've heard of them on the radio, um, but he's kicked off a political group called People to... People Power to the People Party, right? Which is a very strong anti-crime mob like we are, right? So, um, they're the only people I know who are involved in politics, no one else is. And if anybody ever wanted to run under the Protect Victoria banner, they can't do it because we have it as a .org, right? We own the name and we would not allow that name to be used for a political purpose because we don't want anybody ever saying to us, oh, you support such and such a party. We don't support anything. Our people vote is totally up for them. As a matter of fact, I don't even know how I'm going to vote. But you can be guaranteed it won't be for the ALP or for the Liberal Party. <laughs> right, folks, that's about all I've got to say. I think we're moving right on time. Are we 3 o'clock? So I tell the police we're going to get out of here at 3 o'clock. I need a beer. I think Aidy needs to buy me one. Um, where is Aidy? Uh, okay. 
Um, so thank you very much for coming once again. I'm sorry that we didn't get the 300 odd people that had committed to on Facebook. But maybe if we get a bit of media coverage about this, maybe if people start talking about this, then maybe at the next one, we'll get more people. Because I think that Daniel Andrews' electorate office deserves a visit from me in the next two weeks. I also feel that we need to have a little rally in front of the courts. Um, I'm hesitant to do it during the business days, like some people have said, because we're just really strewing around people. And we don't really want to do that. What we want to do is have it on a Sunday afternoon where people can wander out and all that sort of nonsense, okay? And just generally have fun. We're not affecting people. Like, remember the taxi driver thing on the Westgate Bridge? I mean, I was in town when that happened, and they were all, some of them were meeting here, and people were walking past and saying, we're taking Uber from now on. <laughs> and that's what the taxi drivers were protesting about. <laughs> But they sort of got the people really offside with blocking the traffic and all that crap. So we don't want to do that. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much from me, uh, from Rachel and from Avi. Um, thank you for turning out. I'm sorry we didn't get the numbers that I was promised, but I guess this is our first rally. We will continue to build on this. Now, if you want to have a bit of a chat about something, I don't want to give the Imperial the plug, but it's the closest hotel to where I am. So I'm just going to wander over there and whip the whistle, as they say. All right, thanks, folks. Mm. Round of applause to uh, the Protect Victoria. Good on them. We need more Victorians standing up, guys. Remember, you are the voices. Everyone's got a voice. Everybody's got a platform. We don't want to rely on mainstream media because, as you can see here today, they're not going to come unless there's some violence. So, it's up to you. It's up to us. We'll all stand up, unite, and stand against what is happening in our state. Take it back. We want a safe, secure Victoria. We want to make Victoria safe again. Stand behind our police. Protect our kids. Feel safe to go out at night. Exactly. Everything Victoria has not has become not. Our kids should be able to go to High Point and not be here if they're safe getting their night shoes taken off them or their phone. Exactly. I'm sorry, but that is a fact. You don't our need to, kids not, you don't need to be sorry. go to the shopping you. centre. Yeah. Good on you guys. Well done for coming. So Protect Victoria's rally was a reasonable success, only about a hundred people, which uh, the organisers were a bit disappointed with, uh, but thankfully there was no Antifa or any other leftist groups who uh, came to disrupt it, but it was a good starting point for uh, Protect Victoria and they have uh, more events planned in this crucial uh, state election year. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed the Unshackles coverage and uh, stay tuned, we'll have uh, more on the ground reports in the future and uh, this is Tim Wilms once again reporting for The Unshackled. This has been an Unshackled Fast. Please like, comment and subscribe. While you're here, grab our free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and visit theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.